So if you go to GoVeg.com, you'll see on the left-hand side, health, environment, human rights, animal welfare. Um, and all of the statistics and everything else that I say is there um, with full citations. One of the things that's in the health section is, are human beings naturally carnivorous? Are we designed to eat meat? And there's a chart by a physician with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine named Milton Mills, and it's called Comparative Anatomy of Eating. And it lists the, it has a, it's a chart, so it has the physiology of meat eaters, the physiology of, herb, of herbivores, the physiology of omnivores, and the physiology of human beings. Human beings are 100% with the herbivores and 0% with the carnivores and the omnivores. A few of the things that categorize every species that eat any significant amount of meat, they have about five times the bone teeth density that human beings do so that they can chomp through the bones of their prey. They have about 10 times as much hydrochloric acid in their stomachs so that they can digest rotting corpses, something that human beings can't do. They have a very short digestive tract to get the rotting flesh in and out very, very quickly. Uh, and the list goes on and on. It's about 20 things and it's there. Intuitively speaking, we all know this if we think about it a little bit. You know, how many of us, if you're driving down the road and you see a dead animal on the side of the road, you know, most people in this room probably go, oh, dead animal. Um, a lot of people out there go, ugh. Some of us probably have that reaction a little bit as well. Um, none of us, right, go, mm. You know, none of us have the, ooh, I'm hungry, response to roadkill because we're not natural carnivores. And our bodies see the roadkill and they don't think food, which is what an animal who was designed to eat raw flesh would think. And of course, we're the only species that has to cook our flesh in order for the bacteria in the flesh not to kill us. So however long ago we learned, hey, if we, you know, cook this with fire and kill the bacteria, it won't kill us. But in the long term, it still does. We have a, a brand new, it's not even up yet, uh, feature. It'll go up on GoVeg.com in the next day or two. It talks about the fact that when you work with your physiology rather than against your physiology, as uh, Carl Lewis talks about, he says uh, he was called the Olympian of the century by Sports Illustrated. He's a vegan. He says, my best year of track competition was the first year I ate a vegan diet. By continuing to eat a vegan diet, my weight is under control. I like the way I look. Celine Studemeyer, uh, guard for the Atlanta Hawks, talks about how since he adopted a vegan diet, he never gets tired. And by the end of the game, he can outperform his teammates. He's very modest about it. He talks about how he's not a better player, but at the end of the game, it seems like he's a better player because his vegan diet gives him so much energy. And the list goes on. In the long term, it does kill you, though. Eating against your physiology rather than with your physiology um, will kill you in many instances. This book came out last year. If you have a relative with angina or if you have a relative who has suffered from any sort of heart disease, um, I beg you to give them this book. It proves that heart disease is completely not just preventable but reversible. It's the only, there are, two, there are two people in medical history who have published peer-reviewed science wherein they took people with advanced state heart disease and not just arrested it, but reversed it. Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Caldwell Esselstein. And they both used a low-fat, completely vegan diet to do it. In this book, and the, this book actually developed from an American Journal of Cardiology article about Esselstein's study, in this book, he tells story after story after story of people whose cardiologists told them, you know, go home and die, basically. Some of them said literally that, um, or you need quintuple bypass surgery. Um, Esselstein talked to them, and this is at the Cleveland Clinic, which is the top-rated heart, cl heart clinic the last seven years in a row. Um, he took them and he unclogged their arteries. He reversed their heart disease. Sometimes he had to use statins. Other times he didn't have to use statins. But the control group, the group that was on the American Heart Association diet, less than 30% of your calories from fat, less than 10% of your calories from saturated fat, takes these drugs, those people got worse. They got worse more slowly. They didn't get worse as quickly as they, used to, as they were getting worse before they went on the AHA diet, but they got worse. 
Whereas on Esselstyn's diet, he had 100% success in not just arresting heart disease, but reversing heart disease. I mean, this is remarkable. Heart disease kills almost as many people as everything else combined. It's almost to 50%. For men, it's a little over 50%. You take every cause of death, you take heart disease. For men, heart disease is here, everything else is here, it's just as much. And yet what he's proved is that if your cholesterol level is below 150, you will not have a heart attack. And with a low-fat vegan diet, most people can get their cholesterol level below 150. With a low-fat vegan diet and drugs, everybody can get their cholesterol level below 150. Absolutely a remarkable book. Again, working with your physiology rather than against your physiology. Dr. T. Colin Campbell is the foremost epidemiolog epidemiologist in the world. He's a nutritional scientist at Cornell University. He published what the New York Times called the Grand Prix of Epidemiology, the China Study. Another fantastic book. It came out a couple of years ago, and it makes much the same argument that Esselstyn makes about heart disease. Uh, T. Colin Campbell makes about uh, cancer. At the end of his, uh, the China study, he came to this conclusion. He said, the vast majority of all cancers, cardiovascular diseases, and other forms of degenerative illness can be prevented simply by adopting a plant-based diet, working with our physiology rather than against our physiology. Of course, if you work with your physiology rather than against your physiology, you're also more likely to maintain a healthy weight. Uh, all of the studies that have been done, the only studies in which people have taken weight off and kept the weight off at five years in peer-reviewed science have involved a vegetarian diet. The Atkins diet specifically, there's, it's been around since the 70s, and there has been not a single peer-reviewed paper published about the Atkins diet that found success beyond year one. So yes, it's a starvation diet. At one year, if you're still on it, you should lose weight. But some of the more famous Atkins dieters, Bill Clinton, ended up with quintuple bypass surgery in the hospital. And Al Gore ended up the butt of the late night talk show jokes about three years after he went on the Atkins diet and very uh, publicly lost a lot of weight. He gained it all back and then some. Um, and then Atkins himself healed over dead at about 260 pounds. Not a particularly effective diet. And Dr. Dean Ornish, um, who I mentioned in the previous slide about heart disease, he put people on the low-fat vegan diet to unclog their arteries and prevent heart disease. What he found is they lost an average of more than 20 pounds. So then he also published Dr. Dean Ornish's uh, Eat More, Way Less, it's called. And the introduction to Eat More, Way Less does as good a job as anything I've seen um, at looking at the way that the diet industry preys on people and how what you need is not a diet, but a change in lifestyle. The science indicates that meat eaters have three times the obesity rate of vegetarians. They have nine times the obesity rate of vegans. So you can still be obese as a vegetarian or a vegan, uh, but the lifestyle certainly indicates much less likelihood of it. 